but I also read a report that basically researchers by the research if you can long term effect of the meditation on the body type and biodiversity, and they found that it had little more effect on it. And instead, yeah, there was a lot of wildlife there. And they concluded that uh, the human focus and strain on the wildlife, and if they were interested in the environment, wildlife flourish, and they tried to reproduce this uh, research in an other nuclear reactor site that had the Fukushima district. And they found the similar results. And then they shifted the studies to finding you know, individual deformities in the uh, species. And how could you really not see anything? And they're still trying to do that. So basically, our belief is that the radiation spread by lifetime, but it was not the case. Radiation did not negatively impact the wildlife there. Radiation did not negatively impact the wildlife there? I yeah, I actually read that book. Okay. So what how would you explain the deformation you've seen from insects up to yes, up so to basically in the small animals it affected them, but that was nice to guard it because not very to the right effect. And the video, second video we saw, so basically in the spiders, the spider formation and the small insects, the color patterns, they were affected. I'm not saying that because it was affecting the DNA. Yeah. But overall, if we're talking about the biodiversity, it's important. Like yeah, so I think it depends on again how you look at it, right? The insects probably were there and had maximum exposure to what was going on as a result of the nuclear explosion. Whereas maybe the bigger animals had a choice of going away from the radiation. So there is evidence, definitely, in the report of birds and their eggs. So if they lay their eggs there, it, it was like the, the eggs were, um, they, they weren't properly, their shells were weak um, and, and they lost their species. So I think that brings us to a pollutant and its interaction with an organism. So the exposure to it. Um, insects in general and the smaller the organism, their ability to adapt is so much better. And it also depends, we, we said about the life cycle. For example, for viruses and bacteria, it would be easy to adapt or change and reform because, or, and then reform or mutate, as, as you say it in, in biology, because they die and, and are born every day. And not in numbers, but millions. So when, you, when we plate a bacteria on an egg or plate, you say millions of colonies are, are born in, in that six to eight hours. We can't say this for us, no, it's, it's the time that it takes. And so anything that happens, on the one hand, it can have lower impact. And on the other, I mean, any mutation that happens, it would be difficult for us to um, adapt it uh, in the long term. So I'm sure that the report came with some substance and that brings us to the assignment. Um, so you read something, right? That narrative was, of course, backed up by research. And the research was focused on insects only, which is biodiversity that was smaller in size, had maybe smaller reproduction cycles. But what's the other narrative? Like, did you, when you were reading the article, did you also think about, hold on, that doesn't make sense. The video also said that the birds were impacted, that the bird eggs were impacted. So would you go and find out other resources and other research done by biologists on the birds as well? And then bring back and put that information as, a, as additional information. So in literature and in science, for example, when we write a paper, when I introduce a concept, I just introduce it from a sense of making and a reader understand what I'm talking about. So giving them the bigger picture, but when it comes to, so what I hope you would do in the assignment is gather research as well. So gather narratives as well. Yes, my research told you that um, for osmosis and membrane distillation is the top most technology available for wastewater treatment. But a researcher in Pakistan claims that that is not the technology we need at the moment. Um, that researcher claims that actually wetlands could be the best way 
of changing wastewater in a country like Pakistan. So I am coming from what my training is, what my work is, but I will not talk about simple nature-based adaptations or nature-based solutions to environmental problems. So when you write your assignment, I hope that you can read, read an article of your choice. I do not want to impose anything on you because I'm sure that up until now, there are issues that you like more than um, other issues, a problem that hits you harder or more or is close to home than any other issue that someone else is uh, more worried about. So just pick that up, pick up an article that makes sense to you, that you enjoy reading, and then look at who's written it. If, if I'm claiming that um, microplastics were found at the top, level of Mount Everest, which research backs it up? Is it a proper peer-reviewed research? Or is it someone just randomly walking by and seeing a 5 ml plastic and then calling it plastic? Was I actually there? Or, and how, many, how, how much research or literature supports what is being said? Um, and, and I bring this assignment to you because a lot of what goes viral these days is very, you know, it's shocked, it's sensationalized, and oftentimes it's fake. Um, and we did talk a lot about it last time because one of the students was working on fake news. Um, and we talked about, you know, how this, this culture of sensationalism oftentimes puts public to a domain that, that essentially isn't true. So for example, instead of focusing on an environmental issue and it's solution, you would bring something else, for example, I don't know, the indigenous culture, and talk more, more about that while you're slowly trying to wipe out the indigenous population out of the, out of the space. So oftentimes what's projected um, is, is not, you know, it's often in the interest of bigger interest groups. Um, and I like how anti corporate this, uh, this course is becoming, but you know, that, that is and is not my intention. It, it basically is the fact that there are systems that are run by people in power who have gone to every corner of the universe. And I often say it with, with for example, with reference to Gilgit, when, where a lot of basic necessities when I was young weren't there. You know, a lot of health care and other things that you get to see in, in bigger cities, but some weren't there. But Pepsi, Coca Cola, Nestle's water bottle had found its way to one of the remotest villages. So the fact that these systems are established for basic rights to not reach a space, but these products to make it to, to these corners is a fact that there's something wrong with the system. And the system is designed to, to benefit some people more than the other. Um, so yeah, so, uh, so just a, just a sense of direction as to what, what I expect to, to receive from the, uh, from the present assignment. But do not worry too much about getting everything right. And I also have an issue when you ask questions down to the level where you say, you know, what should be written? Um, I want you to think about what's, I want you to explore that. I do not want to tell you this should, the introduction should be five lines that should talk about what's there and what's not there. Just, just go and explore it for yourself. Let your brain cells decide what you think is more important. And, and, and also that brings me to how generous I have been in marking your uh, quiz and uh, written patterns, partly because I hadn't assessed anything before and I thought uh, I should be generous with you this time. But I think I can't be doing the same next time. And the reason being, if the Padlet said, said uh, identify a problem and tell us what can you do about it, everyone, like 80% of the class just went and what about the problem. And they missed the second half of the question. Um, so I don't know. Bring things to focus. Make sure that you read uh, what is being asked uh, in the questions or otherwise. Yes, I'm sure. Um, 
this time around, maybe not like I won't be too fussy about citations, but it'd be nice to at least have the links so you can see the information from. Do not worry about what kind of citations to use. When you write it, make sure that the sources are just proper. I don't need to use any format like FLA or something like that. Whatever you're more comfortable with. Because it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Yeah, I mean, the, there is some explanation as to what the structure should be. So like what's written there, who's written it, what's the source, um, what is the counter narrative, what does the hypothesis want to prove, is there, are there other opinions, how does the author eventually justify it. So in a way, there is a structure there, but it's okay if, you know, that structure is happening. And you say one thing before the other, but the introduction to conclusion should make sense to me. As a reader, like just look at how would I read it or any other reader, a reader read it, and what would they get out of it. So today, I think this, because all of this is super simple, uh, I'm not sure how much should I tell you about this or whether I should ask you about, about some of this. Um, so think about the natural capital, which all of you had guessed right in the and then think about the services that that, that natural capital gives us. Um, and in terms of services, now look at how some of the resources that we have for production of electricity, a lot of our needs, um, is coming from a certain source. And if you've heard or seen any of this around you, maybe you can and, and pick any from the list. Um, maybe you can tell me. Uh, about anything that you've seen around you, or you've heard of, or if you've ever been to a coal power plant, etc. Just just pick anything from the list and we can we can talk about it. Or if you have question for for something on the list, uh, feel free to talk about it. I can I can start or a sentence. Yes. I'd like to talk about non-renewable sources and that that. So uh, nuclear energy, you know, it's some it's a chemical uh, type of energy that that, uh, that you get uh, as a result of the unit of the action. But it's non renewable in the sense that uh, the material that is being used to create that nuclear power is, is, is not very large enough. It's uranium or you know polonium or any heavy uh, or super heavy radioactive element. Um, now we create power with that nuclear energy. You know, sometimes they call it it's it's um, it's dangerous, but it's not as much as uh, polluting the environment like it is. But it is not right at all because nuclear energy has much much more effect uh, on the environment than any other uh, you know non renewable resources because nuclear uh, makes they stay in the environment for a million of years maybe because you know. Hardly half lives and everything. It's so interesting that uh, you know, they are not even uh, moved from the soil even after treating the soil. Yeah, great. Uh, I said. So, I'm going to take a this is here, but everybody uses the We're getting there, we're getting to different narratives. There are people who are actually clearing forests, like causing deforestation to grow, for example, sugar cane to then get uh, by or ethanol, which is not good. But there's also a lot of waste that is coming from a simple uh, field, which just goes to waste, uh, specifically if it's being burned. For example, in the case of banana, a lot of it's, um, other than the fruit, whatever comes off the plant, is burnt because it takes time for it to degrade and then that then adds more, um, more GHG emissions into the atmosphere. If that waste could somehow be utilized, crushed, 
brought down to the right size, used as a fuel for bioethanol, I think it would be environmentally. Another way to look at it, for example, is that some food outlets, right? I, I know that the McDonald's that was close to my undergrad university used to use the waste oil and convert it into biofuel and use it in combination with biodiesel uh, for their own trucks uh, that, that were transported there. So that waste to energy is environment friendly. But clearing plants, um, using more GHG emissions, like using more fossil fuels or industrializing and agriculture to grow more sugar cane to produce bioethanol, um, definitely not good for the environment. Any tips? Yeah, so is so why is um so if its source is natural, uh, the already was called oil natural gas. Why is it not like why do we call it non renewable Because its source is natural, it is coming from fossil, like the all these plants that yeah. is staying in the planet for like under high temperature and pressure eventually turn into. So why why is it called non renewable? We can use all the natural resources to, to make possible. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So there are you know it, it takes thousands of years for these fuels to be formed, and um and, and it's it's very well described in your book, but we've also read it. Um, at a very young age, since a very young age, that you know, all of this detritus eventually under high temperature and pressure converts into fossil fuel. And that fossil fuel, which is coal, oil, natural gas, and you know, one can be a little more cleaner than the other. We'll try and make it a bit soon. Um, it's non renewable because it's whatever resources we have, we are using it at a very fast pace. Uh, it's not clean. And then we are going to exhaust. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, only if we take the recycling the water and then the water and 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 the water so I think uh, between all of these, what water is sort of there. If we if we do not disturb the water cycle, which is fine. Wind is sort of related to solar. Sun is always going to be there. Sun is my best friend. So and then wind is sun's best friend. So if there's enough sunlight, there should be enough wind because the sunlight and the change in temperature. And the mixing is something that's possible. Um, biofuel, that's where I, I'll call it. That uh, particularly the point that, that Asa got to that. But then again, there's, like I said, there's a lot of waste that comes out of the field that can be converted into fuel as well. So just last week, uh, for the project that I'm doing, we went to uh, a progressive farmer in Kabul. Very close to on Bavia, very close to the Indian border. He has he is practically just taking everything from his own farm, uh, whether it's dairy, whether it's uh, eggs, meat, everything. Like 
vegetables, everything's coming from his own farm. Um, and he has a small biogas plant. So literally seven to eight cows. And then the garden is being mixed with water. So it's tea stage. And his entire house in that farmhouse is being uh, using the energy that's coming from that. So while I've seen demonstration sites which are very fancy, I had never seen that being used at such a small scale. And that can be done literally in every household in ruler sector in Pakistan. We say that we do not have access to energy. So essentially, like in those three steps, he just had that problem being put in the first step. He was putting in some water, mixing it, and allowing it to come to that anaerobic digester. So we say for methane to be produced, anaerobic conditions are must. So there, that's where he captured the biogas, and then the waste matured and was being used on the farm as a fertilizer for the field. And uh, it, like for me, it was really impressive because I also have a lot of like, family relatives who kind of live a similar life. And they could use this instead of buying the fossil fuel based uh, gas, which is super expensive and it's becoming even more expensive. At a small scale, at a household level, the ability to generate that, that power, I think, or energy is, um, is great. So let's look at I know I said uh, we'll talk about systems. So we'll talk about systems, and we have been talking about systems. We started with the solar system. We talked about the system. Um, essentially, all of these renewable energy, they, they're also kind of a system in their own. Um, so for example, one windmill for the system. And those systems can be, and it, it, it's funny because, you, you know, for example, if you go to the industry tomorrow, it is also a system. And you'll kind of look at the input, like I said, and the output, uh, particularly when you look at the environment. And between that input and output, what you're trying to see is what's going in and what's, going, what's coming out. And in terms of energy, it comes down to efficiency how much energy is being used, which source of energy is being used, and how much of that energy is actually available. So for example, the energy that I use for this computer or the energy that's eventually being utilized in this room is being created by the fossil fuel. The fossil fuel, let's say, must have been extracted from Sui in the latest Right. And then when they when we go back to that source, it was a lot of energy was spent to find that well. A lot of energy was spent to set up an industry there. A lot of energy was spent to put a pipeline all the way to Punjab. Um, a lot of energy was being spent on creating these grid stations. And now even though that system is established, as the fossil fuel comes to the power station or the power plant where, it, where we want the turbines to run, there is still inefficiency in the system. So not you know, just like the natural energy transfer, this uh, energy transfer in the system is also inefficient. So some electricity would be lost friction, some electricity would be lost as heat to maintain the temperature, um, some in the way, some because there are leaks, uh, some because you know there's the leak in the pipeline. And, and, and therefore the energy that's eventually available for us to use from the energy that was initially present, whether that is sunlight or the gas that is coming from Sui, is the net energy. And when you talk about energy, they say it doesn't matter how much energy, it doesn't matter how much energy the sun has, if you look at it this way, it's the energy that we harvest, or it's the energy that's eventually available to us, um, is the most useful energy. So the net energy is more important. So for example, for solar, the, uh, the energy that eventually the solar cells capture to generate energy. 
electrons, to, for the electrons to flow in the net energy. And when we talk about some of these renewable and non renewable resources, that is something that you have to focus on. Solar cells, very, very environment friendly in terms of net energy and efficiency. I think there, there still are a lot of questions. In terms of material for solar cells, there are questions. And I am telling you about all of this, but please be sure that when I tell you about the disadvantages of renewable resources, I'm still a pro renewable resources person. And no matter how, me how many the benefits of fossil fuels are, I will always be in it. A positive person. So yes, these renewables have some disadvantages. One being there's plenty of sunlight, but there might be a time when sunlight will be available to us. How do we then create a system where extra energy is stored for days where there wouldn't be enough? How do we make sure that the sun, uh, the solar cells are not um, so, so the commercial products say up to 70% efficient, but if you speak to researchers like the lungs, they will say, ideally, we only capture 30 to 40% of what's put into the, the cell. Um, so what they say is the electricity that the, the cell would generate is very often not the electricity that the cell generates. It's way less than that. So that net energy is lesser than what was promised you. And what matters to us as consumers, the net energy, the energy that's eventually available to us. But the source is clean. So even if that sunlight is wasted, even if only 30% of it is captured by the solar cell, even if it's storing lesser electricity than was promised, it's still better for the planet. The waste is not a waste that was, would cause any on the contrary, if I have gone and dug deep into the, into the soil, dug deep into the oceans, because the gas and the um, oil resources are often under ocean. And um, I give this example a lot because around the time when I was in the UK, there, was a, there were huge campaigns about fracking, which is hydraulic fracturing. So you dig deep into the oceans to find um, oil and petroleum to, to get more and 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 that's unhealthy because we said that below the ground there is a lot of gases that are there. So whatever is coming out of the production, some of these nuclear products, radioactive products, they could also be released, and that has a lot of implications on life below the ground and the water quality really does go bad. And oftentimes the land goes really bad as well. When we will talk about soil pollution to avoid the disease, we'll look at and I'm sure if not if not all of you, some of you must have seen films around digging oils and how dirty it is and very often how how unjust it is in terms of people who work on the ground. And and also I think even in the case of Pakistan, where it's produced and who benefits from it. They are all then these bigger social systems uh, that, that are also really integrated. So anyone who's living close to it and you expose them to all of those pollutants in the air or in the soil and be impacted by it, may not necessarily benefit from the food that is done to the surface in their area and someone else far, far away from um, so yeah, so back to the systems, and so systems, systems, approach, systems, analysis is something I think very, very fashionable, and in environmental sciences now we also use it like that. We do not, that is, we do not consider one thing as such. When you look outside, like when I, when I was telling you about the cycles, you think of all the cycles, so all the input and all the output and all the transfer of meta and energy. And we said the meta and energy often is constant. Like we're not naturally, there's not new H2O being formed. It's the same H2O that's just cycling back, which is the principle of sustainability that we've been talking about. We're not forming more SO2. 
the SO2 or the sulfur resources are just there. It's transforming and then become coming back to its origin. So that system of, you know, we're not creating anything, it's just transitioning and it's eventually coming back to what it was, whether it's carbon, um, is what, you know, when you think about it. And then an efficient system would be the one, for example, where the net energy is high. Whatever energy you're feeding in, particularly the positives, you're getting out in terms of productivity or consumer energy spend. Um, and then there are a lot of discussions about open system and closed system. In environment, I like to give the example of uh, birth and overpopulation. So if there are more birth, um, if there is more uh, reproduction in the human system, there is a positive feedback. So the population is increased. That's a positive. So the positive always doesn't mean good, it also means bad. So more births, increase in population, increased use of resource. So it would be like a plus, plus, plus on the feedback side that you know, now we're using more resources. But if there are births, Control programs, such as the one in China, where people were using a lot of resources, it was becoming difficult to adjust to population. If that program is introduced, then the feedback on the system would be negative. Now it would negatively impact the system, which means the population will go down, which is eventually good for the environment. Um, so the positive and negative doesn't always mean good or bad, it just means increase or decrease in, in some way. Okay, so we'll not spend too much time there. A revision for people who've forgotten uh, the elementary science that when we talk about energy, we talk about dams, we talk about kinetic energy. Um, there are types and then there are forms. So electricity is a form. Eventually, what do we want when we say, oh, if you're feeling down, eat a banana because it will give you certain energy, it's, it's just a form that will allow you to perform work. And that work can be in a natural system or it can be in a human body, which is also a natural system, but for, for you to function properly in the environment. And a lot of these terms uh, will be used and a lot of these terms are, you know, something that you should know. Renewable? Yes, they are. Radiant is the solar energy or radiation. That is how I Remember, we, we said that each wavelength within the electromagnetic radiation holds a certain amount of energy. So, depending on which spectrum is absorbed, we'll see um, energy of the, on the net energy side. So, if something is absorbing radio energy versus visible light, it could be less or more energy. What radiation they have to, for example, if it absorbs something, um, let's say in the case of the solar cell, it absorbs something, it would also release something. In the case of human body, we absorb heat, but we also release heat. Um, and oftentimes the earth releases a lot of infrared radiation back to the atmosphere. Uh, so that's all radiant, just a form. Eventually, it's, it's energy and work is happening. Uh, the natural system is, is at work, but otherwise, one form of energy. So, mostly like with reference to radiation. Major activity is the term that I would use for you here, which is um, again a form. They may not be entirely different, right? In major activity, you now have a chemical or let's say uranium that's been hit by a neutron just dividing and fission is happening so there's like this crazy reaction now where neutrons keep hitting uranium and have more energy being released into the system but it's chemical energy so, so again like in the list there was chemical energy as well it is chemical energy but it is being released by a nuclear reaction and it's Radioactive energy. So they're just like forms are different. The sources, in the end, like a lot of sources relate to solar anyway. Uh, but um, 
it depends on, like it could be a combination of one of the things. Uh, so it might eventually release some electromagnetic information. Uh, so if it's releasing radio waves, for example. But if you go back, the sign isn't being released from the ring. So, so it's just like another form. The so nuclear radiation is everywhere. Kind of. Thing. Nuclear radiation is limited to where those nuclear materials are. Those uh, those new those rich resources of uranium are. They don't have them. You have to find the resource and you have to create an artificial resource now that enrich everything. Extract everything down, but then eventually enrich everything which are out there. And how about control in the reaction that are out there? Control making sure it's okay. Or Josiah Hum Chernobyl of it's when it gets out of our hands. It just excellent. So they just become so controlled that they can just become so heat for capture of the system. They just become so waste for property described or something. Yeah, I mean, like I said, that things that don't confuse the forms with, with uh, it, but it's not solid one type. It could be a combination and, and they could have different sources and different. So, for example, nuclear also is chemical. I right? just have to make a chemical. Yes. Uranium, that's it. Um, it's then divided into two other isotopes. And wo usko vapis uranium banani kade, you need a, another kind of nuclear reaction, which is called fusion. But usme aapko input energy dene ko. Even in, um, in the case of uh, fission, you have to invest some energy, particularly all that energy which is required to cool the setup down to the temperature. It's non renewable, I think, whose source eventually exhausts. Or there is some masla ye hai which is why, if it was easy to take, like, convert the waste back into the source, uh, of course it would be renewable. But when we cycle it, we have to renewable this. But because now the waste is not just one job, it's 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 Usko discard the acid selection. You do usme thori bohat radioactivity with the reaction chal raha hai. That's one one. We got heat release for you. Or usko discard the acid selection. So people have created these setups, but I think that is the biggest challenge that we face. Or cause for the development. So one of my one of my fellow group members in the period which is still was working exactly on this. She was trying to look at rocks below the ground away from aquifers where these nuclear wastes could be discarded and then sealed. So that radioactivity is going to impact the planet or its surroundings, even the earth, even the water quality. So she was testing different materials. They were grounds, they were just just they were fractures for in the rocks, fill it or he had a solid set of things that was back in the college courses now. Yeah, I think it depends. If someone's able to develop the kind of reaction where the waste goes back to the uh, source and it's sustainable enough for us to make energy, you could know, call it renewable at that particular point. Uh, but otherwise, it's, it's not. TJT, any question that you have so far? Because I know I skipped a lot of the slides. Also, we call them 
system in itself is a smaller system. So what system analysis thinks is you know, trying to understand it better. And, and the scale can be better. And the box can be better. So the, the deeper you go into the system, even for example, this one electrical gadget could be your single system, which you're trying to understand. And then you can also go back to the factory level. Call that system. Um, so system analysis is more about the way you look at solving. So looking at this room as a system, every input and every output. So then, what about my body? It's also a system. And and then I have breakfast today and I have lunch today. You know that's another input. That, that, that you can pick up. So system, but the way hard and fast definition is more about looking at everything in inclusivity in the environment or her cheese for consider here. And it's now like I said the professional thing because it's the end of was ache and then the if you're working on nuclear nuclear tests, but now you know that nuclear is also related to water, it's also related to soil, it's also related to climate. I guess would be more systems approach to the That yes. And how can you differentiate between the forms and types of energy? The forms and types, yeah. So uh at me, but the, 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 the types are not very difficult to differentiate, right? You can get into static or motion. Um Uspakatapuski uh, like you're looking at where it is and how it is. So, for example, a fossil fuel which is stored deep below the ocean is a potential energy. But the fossil fuel that has come up is being sent into a power plant is sort of now a kind of because it's in motion and it's the whole even there the, 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 the difference is not clear. So the dam in itself is potential energy. The moment the water starts moving, it's kinetic of energy. So, um, and then from Smithura, it, it's just like the display. Electricity it is a form. So any chemical reaction, anything that's related to it, um, could be multiple things. That, that the form do I have, is it somehow related to the type of the electricity and it was moving from one place to another, it is carrying kinetic energy? Yeah, so if it's moving, it's kinetic. But the, again, these are not the things that you should worry too much about, but you also should worry about it if you're thinking of a system. So if you're thinking of the system within Pakistan of transfer of the gas, of water being stored in a dam electricity coming your way, the distances, the flow, the waste that would be associated with it would be important. But I think knowing these terms is more important rather than religiously defining them. That, that is okay with you guys. Okay, so like I said, net energy is more important, not, not anything else. It's the energy that eventually gets to the consumers that is more important. Uh, if you look at some of these, these are examples of your natural capital and your uh, renewable energy. And one thing that we haven't talked about, which is also related to nuclear activity or radioactivity, is geothermal energy. 
that is said to be renewable. So the, the question about can, uh, can nuclear energy be called renewable? This essentially is renewable nuclear energy because the heat that's been generated uh, below it's sort of contained there. We're not allowing it to escape, but any heat that is released um, causes for the water to warm up, rise, come to the surface, and be used passively. It's passive use, but if it's, for example, going to a turbine and generating electricity, it's active use. Similarly, for sunlight, agar aapnek sun room banai hai, or it's receiving heat and your room is warming up in winter, it's passive energy, you're not really putting any technology there, just the right direction. Uh, whereas if you're putting solar cells or solar panels on your roof, it's active capture of the energy. So one 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 ends for these sochniki as environmentalists look at how can we live out the use of any technology by simply placing our room in a certain direction. I know it doesn't matter for people here, but Bahar Jab Kamronke or Karunke acts just then. They tell you like which room is facing the sun, whereas the wind coming from because for some people it is a really important cast of the air pollution in the air of the sun or area. Yeah, if it's super cold, then then those things are really important. Or warm as well. I think in our case it's how many bucks and a double and uh, they eventually need more air conditioning, which eventually needs more energy, which is not good for the plant. So your design, your architecture, your contributes to it as well. Their wind environment. So this we kind of talked about, but I think I'd also like to talk about the what one energy hydroelectric is dams, but the other is dampless energy. Uh, so if you've seen setups in Sabat, if you've seen setups in Chital or the North, we don't have a lot of space to store a great deal of water because there are small valleys. But there is a lot of water coming from in the watershed uh, that is flowing under gravity that simply can be captured. So you have water coming from the mountain to the river. You just need to channel it and you just need to put a turbine in the middle. Store it somewhere, maybe for it to be sustainable. You can find the source of channel So store it somewhere in smaller quantities. You know that the water is continuing to come in. Put a turbine um, or, a, or a power station with it uh, close to it and then give electricity to the village. So that's exactly what my village does. And um, this is my standard way of showing up of how sustainable my community is because they are using. That and then my village is providing electricity to the villages nearby and it's a clean source of energy. So that's called micro hydens. You will read a lot of micro hydro power projects in the current government's manifestos as well. Because a lot of places that are deprived of electricity have the potential for these uh, micro hydro power plants to be established. But then, of course, we read about the environmental impacts of big. Dams. Even in the case of micro hydro, if it's not properly put, uh, there have been cases of the pipes bursting communities that are living next to it because it's coming with high pressure. You're redirecting it in a certain way. So there have been cases where sometimes the pipes will burst, people have to flee their homes and stay elsewhere until those were fixed. Still less the destruction than, than maybe dams, uh, but. Uh, that, they, you know, that there are some disadvantages. I'm not saying that it's absolutely flawless. And, and about wind, I think we put these, um, wind is very, a lot of people who use wind energy or harvested wind energy is that it's very easy. So you do not need a great deal of wind um, because if their structure, even if it's just moving slowly, it does capture a lot of energy and it's clean. And like I said, it has a relation with them. With the sun, but there's something that I want to talk about. Which I've forgotten. Yeah, life below water. So when you, I think one of the most important things for environment is environmental flows. So the rivers, the natural system, has to have a minimum flow uh, to reach the ocean. 
If that doesn't happen, then the seawater would intrude in the land. So in Karachi, for example, in the mangroves, if we're not sending enough water in the rivers, which is called environmental flows, that ocean, that, that seawater would kind of, kind of come back and invade those systems. And the life that lives between in transition will be lost. Um, and similarly, you know, we said these waterways are also gateways or corridors for species to you know, move in, in a system. Um, and if you contain it, if you stop it, then that movement is also compromised. And naturally, it is being designed such that that water body also carries soil with it, um, rich nutrients with it from the mountain. So that sedimentary cycle is important as well. Otherwise, how would the phosphorus that's stored in the rock make it to Punjab, uh, where there are uh, lesser mountains than the most? We almost, so I think we've discussed all of this, so I wouldn't worry too much except for the biofuel. So, do we want to talk about biofuel, or do you guys have an understanding of what biofuel is? Come on, I, I want, you know, I like it when quieter people talk, even if it's wrong. Now, we're saying, I'm going to Oh, okay, go ahead. Huh. I knew this question would come from it now. I came prepared. I'm feeling it was already there. Uh, where is it? Right. Here we go. So you have uh, these sugars reacting with water, becoming glucose or fructose, and eventually the glucose is something that converts into ethanol. All biological, all enzymes, all natural ingredients, uh -huh. and, and most of this is waste that's coming from from crops. Huh. 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 So basically, I probably just told you that these sugar forms input content. So maybe I need to go back and look at my slides. So if it's if it has oil with it, I would have called it alcohol. But biodiesel, for example, is just oil. Just existing oil, and you see for our our diesel is So that is other forms of hydrocarbon close to the diesel. Similarly, for biogas, that is just methane and combination of other gases. So bio biofuel is of let's say three types. One that is close to natural gas, one that is close to crude oil, and one that is close to alcohol or ethanol. So sources, more or less same, right? they can to product it. It could be alcoholic in nature, it could be oilish in nature, or fatty acids or so, or it could be just medium in combination. We got it, didn't get it. But I also need to go back and see what I've written here in the slides. Huh. Well, it's like we could give a summary of So, bio alcohol is essentially ethanol mixed with uh, gasoline. So, I just said what it is, like I said. Um, so, ethanol, vegetable oils and fats. And use the diesel energy. What I, I actually wanted to say here is that when these fuels were produced, they weren't solely used as a fuel in the car. So, for example, could biogas replace the CNG that you get from the CNG stations? That was a big question because efficiency again, net energy is a part of that. But people used to use it in hybrid cars in combination. Now it, it's not the same anymore. There are cars that run and trucks that run totally on bio, totally on biogas that's coming from natural resources. So technology is evolving as we talk, and products are formed as we talk. 
just some real education of this. That's just my dream. So if it doesn't make sense, make sure you go to the to the actual equation or to the actual information and get the top part. I want to make sure that I don't teach you anything new today, but two things. First, why is fossil fuel so bad? Why am I so anti fossil fuel? Look at all the products that it's that's coming out of, let's say, crude oil. And, and all of them have negative impacts, right? Some of them have really useful use in your life, which is gases, aviation, et cetera. But here is the product that I'm most interested in. And that product that I'm interested in because, does anyone have an idea? Meta. So nectar is a byproduct of crude oil. So if you heat it, there are different products that can come out of it because we said it's a lot of hydrocarbons, right? Different hydrocarbons coming together to form crude oil. Now all of them will have different boiling points, and you will separate different products based on their boiling points. Gases have the lowest boiling point, so they'll be easy to extract. So look at also the energy that's going here. Just to get the gas out, you also have to use energy. But this particular product is the raw material for plastic, which, which I will be focusing a lot on this course, which actually brings me to an activity that we have almost designed with the LUMS Environmental Action Forum, which would be you guys creating awareness in LUMS about single-use plastic in LUMS. So, uh, you know, because a lot of people do not think about where it's coming from. Plastic is not just plastic, plastic is also plastic. Plastic is also all the energy that's going on uh, in. Plastic is also all the pollutants that are being released here, here, and eventually here. Plastic's also not just the microplastic uh, that's coming out as a byproduct of, the, of this. So yeah, so relate again. Yes. So yeah, okay, that's a good question. So the renewables and non-renewables are not defined in terms of scale, time scale. They are defined in terms of availability. Renewable is the one that is where the source is continuously available. Round the clock, but mostly round, like throughout, not at night, like sun is not available at night, but it is available there. So it can be renewed. Water can keep coming back to the land. That cycle is just there. So we're not going to lose water in the uh, It's actually just going to be there because that's where the flux comes from. And that's where the system comes from. That we have a system where we are going to get all of this water back into um, the, the earth. And most of it, at least, there's, there's a lot of maps. So the, the fluxes and the balances, that's, that's one of the most interesting things that we learn in to the engineering side of things where what's coming in and what's leaving and how it's recycling is there's like a fine balance there as well. And studying that is really, really interesting too. Um, so yeah, good question, but renewable and non-renewable refer to the source and availability of the source. And yes, you know, fossil fuels have been around for such a long time that people think that they're not going to run out of them anytime soon. But we are going to be running out of them sometime soon. But the question isn't about when or you know, because we are becoming efficient, we are now topping up, topping it up with other renewable resources. The question isn't whether we're going to run out of nuclear waste or with nuclear energy or fossil fuels anytime soon. The question is, is it the right thing to do given all the science? And, and scholarship that exists. Is it the right resource to use? 
and everything that we've seen tells us otherwise. I think for me, more than the non-renewable part, it's what will fix what for the planet. Um, so even if we had a, a non-renewable resource around us, some countries do have enough resources for them to last you know, for, for hundreds of years because they're rich in fossil fuels. But does that mean that they should continue to use um, fossil fuels? I brought it back to the last yesterday. Okay, so again, the impact of microhydrogen is not as great as of dam. If you guys, this here, I got to see this beautiful uh, rock carving that's going to be submerged as a result of the Grand Tasha Dam. Um, it's gorgeous. It's one of the most beautiful rock carvings I've ever seen anywhere. Um, and yeah, that's a lot of culture there for you. So in a way, sometimes maybe for to think of it as a from a Buddhist community point of view, that's the history that's going to be submerged underwater. Um, and while the impact of microhydal on life wouldn't be that much, because we're just containing a small channel and bringing it to to life, there might be some absorption. In a way, like because it's an open system, you take water and then you bring it back to the system. I would say the impact is minimal, but I cannot say it's zero. Because if that water body had trout, for example, coming from, because we talked about the higher deal that trout do. So let's say, let's say if it's bringing trout, um, and in the process, they're destroyed, or the eggs are destroyed, then it will have an impact on it what the river will have in terms of that. But it should be very, very minimal. These channels are really small. Um, so the, the impact side of relates more for the um, dams, not for for microhydrates. are actually, for example, in the case of again, my village, that water is now that channel is sent to another area where we did not have fresh water. So because there was that infrastructure that existed, it's now redirected to another space where we didn't have water, and that area is cleaning and it's making us more secure. So, yeah, I think it depends, and it also probably varies from place to place. There was one more thing that I didn't want to miss before, maybe, even that we can maybe talk about it. Yes, energy efficiency. So, what should our target be for? To, to make this planet sustainable. We've talked about all the energy resources. You know, we talked about as renewable as non renewable. We talked about the impacts that they could have on the planet. What are some of the approaches that you as students of environmental sciences would take, would ask your governments to take in order to reduce the impact? of our energy source on the planet. Well, okay, let me, let me put it this way. How can you reduce your individual footprint of uh, energy consumption on the planet?
Absolutely, yes. Yeah, yeah. There's some Yeah, absolutely. Yes. 100%. I, I, I do agree. So, a lot of criticism that Lahore gets is it's growing laterally. So, we are expanding this. People now have, people have such big homes written. With written ayahs on them. Like I have basic written mashallah. It's like, no, the religion doesn't tell you to live such a luxury life with mashallah, or to you reduce your work. Uh, so, so, yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh, in, in this thing, in, in technology that can produce energy efficient products, for example, uh, so, uh, investing in technology that can produce more cleaner, or uh, you can say, the energy, uh, environment. Products and electric cars, awesome. Yeah, so electric, electric cars were quite in last semester in the course because some people really wanted to invest, were invested in it. Um, so maybe we'll get to talk about it when we do. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, what do you have there? For example, you have most of the space sector. I mean, rocket is the energy consuming system. Compared to the person, energy on the Huh. So every time I talk, tell you about your individual footprint, I also almost always try to bring it to systems and people in power. And people in power do not care. That. So for him, even like spending that little money, so he did spend, we actually have a case study about Elon Musk in our SDG related lecture, uh, where we're trying to look at all these people who give us some money to make environment efficient products. Are they actually environment friendly people? And I think it goes back to the system. It could be Elon, it could be anybody else, but um, it's kind of the system's just so so inefficient. So I think this criticism went quite wide as well that he's thinking about taking people to space, having a small experience of going and seeing Mars. While people die of COVID in the hunger and do not have the basic necessities that is needed in life. Again, those are ethical questions and not everyone has raised ethically. Why should you don't worry about who's dying of COVID in hunger in different parts of the world and who can actually go and explore this? So, as sad as it is, that's exactly how people power operates. Um, and, and if you look at that funnel kind of example that we had of how it's the rich, the powerful, who have most emissions, and eventually the companies. So the company says these people own who have a lot of footprint of the planet. And if they get corrected, it would, it would produce a lot of work. But do we, by doing that, we have putting the blame only on them, we haven't done anything at all. As well. So I think for me, this was important to know that, yes, like, countering the systems is important, but if we change our individual actions, a lot of these projects would automatically have to change what they are giving us and what they put up, put there for us on the shelf and, and our consumer. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. So So this, this was like a huge debate when I was, uh, so for example, in places where electric cars are being introduced, where the electricity for the charging ports is coming from was the biggest question. When, if you're switching from your car to um, an electric car, and eventually you have charging stations or you charge it at home and the electricity is coming from fossil fuels, 
fuel is a really environment friendly, given that you spent a lot of energy trying to manufacture these cars. Future booster, I think I think I want you to go home and look this up if you can. Um, just look at the different narratives again around electric cars. There is a lot of question about the battery um, that the electric cars have and how um, a limited resource is used in it and how we could eventually run out of it, so I won't name it, but, but then also what the impact of that waste battery is on the environment because of the product that we extract from the planet and put back um, in the process of the planet. So like I said, oftentimes by taking these fossil fuels out of their reserves and putting it up on the, on the surface, we expose the planet and the people and the life of the planet to some of these pollutants. Okay, so I think the, the lecture is very simple, so I'll leave it for you to, to read uh, because it just 